Good to see you. I agree with Ray. I hope you're all happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. Amen. I'm grateful. Uh, real quick, before we get started, uh, do we have all of our ushers in here? A couple of them? Where's Jim? Oh, that rascal. Ushers, will you please stand up if you have, if you, if you have ushed? We have our ushers, our greeters, ushers and greeters. That would be you too, Stan. Yeah, ushers. These are our unsung heroes of the church. I want to thank you, ushers, greeters. Thank you for all you do. Uh, okay, you may be seated. That's it. Amen. Um, they, they have to sit out front, and they don't have to. They get to. But they sit out front underneath the cold air coming out of the office because i got to keep it like a meat locker in there. And then and they have to uh, brave the heat in the summer cold in the winter. And then, you know, it's tough. It's tough. But I appreciate all that you do, all you ushers and greeters, and I'm grateful for you. Amen.
right, that being said, we are still in our series, our summer series, uh, So You're Saved, So Now You're Saved, So Now What? So Now What? Uh, I pray that this series has been finding you well. Uh, it is difficult for me to come up with biblical examples that, will, that, that I don't just shoehorn a bunch of things into, uh, to try and fit the series. We always want uh, the series to be biblical. Amen? We don't want to try to make the, uh, the Bible stand up on all fours to make it say what we want it to say. We want it to just speak. Let the Word of God speak. Amen? But in to the, tonight's stanzas of Scripture, technically we're going to read the whole chapter if we get to it. We're starting at a pretty good time. We might, be get, we might get done with it. We're going to be reading chapter 9 of the book of the gospel account of John chapter 9 the gospel account of John but before we get there uh, tonight uh, I would remind you Sunday I challenged you to pray for five people pray for five people then in our new members class which is uh, many of them are born again are brand new born again Christians uh, the book that we're going through the starter kit uh, for Christians uh, it, it challenged us to pray for five people in our life. Five people in our life. Uh, but for tonight, we're going to use the other five fingers, on the other hand, to prepare ourselves for five things now that we're saved. Amen? Prepare yourselves for five things now that you're saved. Won't you bow with me as we pray? Father in heaven, greatest God Almighty, we pray for all the families and friends that are uh, well, they're on vacation, out and about, having fun, and we praise you, Lord, for those times. I pray, Father God, that uh, you will bless those who are here in attendance or those who are listening online, uh, whether it be through our website, YouTube, or the like. Father God, I just pray that you help me to read and preach your word tonight and that uh, your Holy Spirit will do his work. Uh, I know there are people that come expecting to hear a word from you, Lord. Indeed, I am endeavoring to preach your word. Speak to the hearts and minds of those who are listening intently. We love you, Father. Uh, we pray, Father God, that you will see unexpected things in our lives, keeping us on our toes. We pray, Father God, that you will give us instruction and we will obey. And we pray, Father, that you continue to build our witness that we might give testimony. And most of all, Father God, my, we worship you tonight in spirit and in truth. In spirit because we have been born again by your spirit in faith through grace. Grace through faith. In truth, Father God, because Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the word made flesh. And we are reading the truth of his word tonight. We lift up our country to you, Father God. We just pray for, we pray for our nation. We pray for the world, Father. And more rattling of sabers every day. We just pray, Father, that peace will reign. And, uh, well, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Even so, Maranatha, come quickly. We love you, Father. Save souls. May the saved be obedient through baptism. And may you continue to grow your church and as you have promised to do, one loving, born-again Christian at a time. In Jesus' precious name, all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Yes, tonight, tonight I'm going to give you five things over the course. I'm going to give you these five things now, but over the course of the next 30-some-odd verses, I'm going to try and pinpoint where they are in these verses. The five things that you should prepare yourself for uh, that when coming to Christ and even having come to Christ is first and foremost the unexpected. The unexpected. Dr. Brown used to say he had more fun by accident uh, as a Christian than he ever did as, as an unsaved man. And I have to tell you, there, I, I don't know if I can say that I have more fun as a Christian because I've been a Christian since I was eight. But I will tell you this, I have an awful lot of fun as a Christian. And the Christian walk is an exciting walk. It's a walk that is filled with excitement and unexpected things. Some things are unexpected uh, in a joyful way, and some things are unexpected in a not-so-joyful way. Your, your AC breaks in the middle of the summer, guess what? That's unexpected, and it's not so joyful. But it's never boring, amen? It's never boring. 
No, you need to prepare your heart for unexpected things. Prepare your heart for instruction. Prepare your heart for instruction. God wants to speak to you through the reading and the preaching of His Word. God wants to speak to you. Prepare your heart and be prepared to obey those instructions. Prepare to be a witness. Prepare to give testimony. Is there a before Christ and is there an after Christ? I can tell you when I was eight years old, there was a before Christ. And there has been an after Christ. And none of my sin has ever been blessed after Christ. Not that my sin was blessed before Christ, but my sin, my sin was not accounted unto me as a seven-year-old. But when I became saved, guess what? I'm now accountable. And the circumstances that I found myself in because of some of my choices, well, let's put it this way. They have helped to build my testimony. That, don't, that doesn't mean I endorse sin. What I can tell you is this, though. As you grow and stumble in your walk, uh, invariably, it will build your testimony. Be prepared. Be prepared to say, yeah, you know, I did that once. But God brought me through it, like my wife was talking about on the podcast. No, prepare to obey, prepare to be a witness and give testimony. But most of all, most of all, prepare to worship. Uh, my daughter was here uh, Sunday after giving birth on Friday uh, to the amazement of some, to the chagrin of others, scolded for being irresponsible and not very wise. But uh, when I heard that these things were said to her, I, I said, well, they, don't, they, they have forgotten who raised her, see. They've forgotten who raised her. You know, every victory in our life, and we've had many, every victory we have had in our life, the first thing we've ever done is praise God immediately. I remember winning the state championship against old Hug High School up in Reno, Nevada. We drove all night, even got pulled over by a cop in, uh, in um, oh, uh, one of those towns. Got pulled over by a cop in one of those towns. We drove all night, and we walked in here. We must have looked like something the cat drug in. Uh, we, we, uh, we came in right as they were getting ready to uh, have Pastor Brown come up. Why? You think I was going to miss worship after getting the state title? Oh, no way, man. Especially in Sparks, Nevada. Who wants to stay up there, you know? Out of the five things I would ask you to prepare your heart for, worship is probably the one that is the most abstract. I had a, a young lady send me a video this afternoon of a rap concert in a church, and they were just going hog wild in there, you know. And I, I want to tell you, I don't have a problem with rap, especially, I mean, they want to rap about the Lord. There's a lot worse things they can rap about. It's just a style of music. She says, what do you think about this? I said, not worship. Maybe wholesome fun. But it is not worship. You see, you, we are made for worship, but worship requires some reverence. Worship requires, requires us to uh, be in a, in a state of ex expectating awe. Expectating awe. You are expecting God to speak. You are expecting God to to do something. You are approaching the sovereign God of the universe. Like I said, I, I told them it looked like a, a bunch of wholesome fun. They're in there and it sounded like a good beat to me. Probably not the most holy use of the church, but that's not our church, right? But that's not to say we don't pull these chairs back once a month and they play games in here, the kids. But see, that's wholesome fun, right? And Christian fun. And I, I can put my amen behind that. But worship is the one thing of those five that I don't think we really ever get to the nitty gritty of unless we are laying prostrate on our face before God. Our worship is a holy thing that we do before God. And our worship is not coerced by God. Rather, our worship is in response to what God has done. Amen. And in re recognition and realization for who God is. Here in John chapter 9, uh, uh, John's gospel uh, account, chapter 9, verse 1, it says, And Jesus passed by, and he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Blind from his birth. This is, is significant that it's mentioned. 
Uh, so you might want to underline that. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Here's the thing, folks. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, anyone that has, I, I was born with the birthmark on my face right here. Sometimes I forget it's there. But no one sinned uh, uh, that I got this birthmark. My uncles used to tell me that God was mad at me. That's why he put a booger on my cheek. And I really thought that that was true. I thought, man, God doesn't like me. He put a booger on my cheek. It's permanent, too. No, understand this. We live, Technically, uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we can blame sin for any, any ailment that we have. But it is not accounted to the child in the womb. Now, there's not there's things people can do to their bodies that will affect children. We know that. But see, back in the first century, they thought every ailment, every imperfection, every problem, hiccup, or issue you had in your life was a punishment from God. Oh, my friends, nothing could be further from the truth. However, God does allow things. Let's talk about that before we move on. There's a lot to get to tonight. You guys got to listen fast. Amen? So God has two wills. He's one God in three persons, but he has two wills. He has a perfect will, and he has a permissive will. Something we went over when I first became pastor almost 13 years ago now. The perfect will of God was that mankind would be fashioned of the dirt of the ground, that uh, he would make, God would make him a helpmate out of his side, and they would live in the garden, and this would be his family. That's God's perfect will. But in his permissive will, he allowed. He allowed man to fall. Now, a lot of people get hung up on this. This is where a lot of people's circuits get fried. But see, is that not, is that not the very essence of grace? Giving pe someone something they don't deserve? See, we, we don't really deserve free will, but God gives it to us. Why don't we deserve it? Because every time we make a choice, we mess it up. But see, the very, the very bedrock of grace, getting what we don't, uh, getting what we don't deserve, it is the ability to make a free moral choice. And we know how that went. Babies don't make choices. Babies don't make choices. And people don't make babies. Praise the Lord, God does. Amen? Just putting that out there. So, yes, we see here that already the first century mindset is, uh, is still in Jesus' disciples. And a lot of times this can bleed in even to the church. You know, if somebody gets a flat say, well, you know what they did. They deserve that. What goes around comes around. Karma, baby, karma. You know, that's an that's a, that's a Eastern mystical philo uh, philosophy. And it has no place in the church. Now that's not to say that the word doesn't say God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, so shall he reap. But know this, that is the law of repro uh, 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 reci re reciprocity. That if you, sow a, if you sow an apple seed, you're going to get an apple. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap things that are in the flesh. It is not karma. Karma is not a Christian concept. If karma was a Christian concept, why is it that Jesus died? Who knew no sin, yet was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. No, karma is not a Christian concept. Karma, karma is a philosophical and mystical idea that does not exist in the Christian realm. But this mindset was prevalent in the first century. Jesus answered and said uh, to their question, who had sinned, the parents or the baby? He said, neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be man man made manifest in him. Now that's fascinating, because it sounds like God made the baby blind. God didn't cause the baby's blindness, but God allowed the baby to be blind. And I, I believe without a shadow of a doubt, he specifically allowed this baby to be blind. Why? Because God had a plan and a purpose for this baby. Did you know, and I, I don't say it as often as I should, but I heard it every Sunday growing up at College Park Baptist Church. They said, Scotty, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. I said, I sure wish he would tell me soon because these platform shoes are killing me. 
You don't know about platform shoes. You're wearing hey dudes. So listen, God has a plan and a purpose for every single human being on the planet. In his permissive will, he allows them to wander off. But he does have a perfect will for all of us. He does have a perfect will for all of us. And I have to tell you, it's oftentimes unexpected. Unexpected. I'm telling you right now. Uh, I've said it here a couple weeks ago. I never expected to be a pastor of a Baptist church. Man, I was preparing. I was preparing to be on the cover of Rolling Stone at one time. You know, most of those guys still all have more, than, more hair than I do. No, God's perfect will for our life is oftentimes very unexpected. But know this, it's never out of the purview of His omnipotent nature. He knows all things before they will happen. He knows all things before they will happen. And Jesus says, neither the parents nor the child did sin, although we can blame sin for the boy's blindness because we live in a fallen world, amen? He says, but uh, this one here uh, was, was born blind that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He said, I must work the works of him that sent me. Who sent Jesus? God sent Jesus. God the Father. I must work the works that's, uh, of him who sent me while it is day, the night cometh, when no man can work. That is true of all of us, my friends. We have a morning, a noon, an evening, and a night in our life. We have a spring, a summer, a winter, a fall, and a winter in our life. And I will tell you, God will meet you exactly where you are in your life. And if you are here tonight and you have yet to walk into or abide in Christ with that purpose in your life, that perfect will of God, He is willing to meet you in any aspect of your life. And He will be the light of your life, even as He is the light of the world and he will shine as bright as the noonday. So don't ever think that it's too late. Amen? God can use us all at any time, anywhere, if he so chooses, and we allow him to do so. But he says, I must work during the day. Jesus' time would soon come that he would go to the cross. While he was here, he was going to do signs and wonders that if they would not believe him because of the law and the prophets and Mo Moses and the prophets, then at least they might believe because of the signs and wonders. He says, as long as I am uh, in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, when he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. Now, this always blew my mind. First of all, my mama told me never to spit. And here's Jesus. He's spitting a loogie in the dirt, you know. And what's he doing? He's making clay. What is this all about? Well, for years, I just, I, Richard, I got to tell you, you know, I, I just danced around it and danced around it. And I thought, is he mixing the divine with the earth? Is, is he showing that he will impart some of who he is, uh, even as he has come in an earthen vessel to another earthen vessel? What's he doing? I don't know. I don't think Jesus had magic spit. Here's what I know. There was a, there's, a t there's instances in the New Testament where they took handkerchiefs from Paul, things that he had, he had touched, one when the, the King James says handkerchief, they're talking like a sweat rag around the neck. They would dust it in water and put it around their neck. We have those even today. And they would take those to someone who was ill and say, this was around the great apostle's neck, and they would be healed. Is it because he had magic sweat? No. The way it was explained to me is this was the point of contact for the person's faith. Even as the woman who had the issue of blood, do you know who I'm talking about? She had an issue of blood where she had been bleeding for years and years and years. And she said unto herself, in her own heart and mind, she said, if I could but touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. There's nothing magical about the hem of his garment. Much has been made ado about the tassels because they were blue and Jewish rabbis wore them and there was some symbology there but there was nothing intrinsically magic or powerful about the clothes that Jesus wore what was it it was her faith in who in Jesus in Jesus so the touch point of his garment was just something for her to reach out to 
even as uh, it says in, in the New Testament, that there are people who, uh, who Peter's shadow cast a shadow on someone, and they were healed. And that was their touch point. This, I believe, is just as simple as that. It was just something that Jesus thought, I will do this, that way he knows I have interacted with him. And it's unexpected. It was unexpected. I guarantee he never woke up that morning either A, thinking he would see again, or B, he would have spit and dirt in his eyes. Amen? But again, now that you're saved, you shouldn't expect the unexpected. God is, God is not some sort of a cookie-cutter type God. He will never contradict His Word. Everything that He does is in direct alignment with His Word, but He does them in unexpected ways. Amen or oh me? Yes, He, he, he made this, uh, this clay, and, and He anointed the eyes of the, of the blind man with the clay. Verse 7, And He said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpreted sent. So he sends them to sent. And he went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. He washed and he came what? Seeing. He washed and he came seeing. You want, to, uh, you, you want to know what to do if you're saved and what you should do now? Wait for instructions. Wait for, do what he tells you to do. If God tells you to do something, just do it. Leave the consequences to him. Quick story, and then we'll move on. I'm a storyteller. This is the absolute worst way you're supposed to preach, according to college and the theologians. Uh, I had preached down there at a church opposite end of Nellis Boulevard, and they asked me for my resume. Of course, I didn't have one then, don't have one now. And they said, well, we really want to call you to be our pastor. I said, well, God's got my number. He wants me here. He'll call. And... Uh, I came here when I was the janitor, and I cleaned all night long, crying out to God, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And at that time, Desert Hills was going through one of its many dramas. Thank God, thank God everybody keeps their drama for their mama these days. And uh, all but one of Pastor Brown's deacons had walked out on them. Don't any of you get any ideas? And I'm not telling you that the clouds parted and God spoke to me. But what I will tell you is, it came to me in my spirit, stand by my servant. Stand by my servant. i got to tell you, I left, I left on cloud nine. I don't know if there is eight clouds before that or 20 after, but that day I left here after cleaning this church on cloud nine because I knew... That if I just trusted in God, everybody would get blessed. Everybody would get blessed. That was almost 20 years ago now, and I'm your pastor. Trust in the Lord, believe in Him also, and He shall bring it to pass. Expect the unexpected, wait for instructions, and then obey. The neighbors, therefore, these had seen him, verse, uh, at the, uh, verse 8, uh, and they which had seen him, that was blind is not uh, said is this him that was uh, that was blind is not this he that sat and begged some said this is he others said ah, it's like him but others said, but he said i am he i am he this is not in your five things to uh, expect to do now that you're saved but one of the things you can do is take ownership i am the one jesus saved the rascal that I was, the man that I'm becoming, I am him. And God loved me in spite of my own self. Some said, this is he. Others said, uh, it looks like him. But he said, no, this is me. It's me, everybody. Therefore, they said unto him, uh, how, in, how, how, where thine eyes were, how were thine eyes open? And he answered and said, a man called Jesus made clay. We forget that he didn't say anything about the spit. You know, he just probably left that out. He said, A man named Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said unto me, Go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And what did he do? And I went and washed, and I received my sight. What a shocker. What a shocker. Reminds me of that old uh, general, that old, that old northern general that came down with leprosy. 
And the prophet leans out the door after being bothered. He says, tell him to go and go and dip, dip himself in the River Jordan seven times. He'll be healed. Or ten times, I can't remember. He says, I got better. There's better water where I came from. Why would I do that? The servant says, hey, what do you got to lose, man? I'm giving you paraphrased versions tonight. What do you got to lose? Go and do what the man says. He goes. He dips himself. And guess what? The leprosy is cleared. The leprosy is cleared. He says, he went and washed, and I, he said, I went, I washed, I received sight. Prepare for the unexpected, prepare for instruction, and prepare to obey. Now that you're saved, what? Prepare for the unexpected. Prepare for instruction, and prepare to obey, and leave the consequences to God. They brought him to the Pharisees, uh, they, they brought him to the Pharisees, that aforetime was blind. They brought the blind man to the Pharisees. Verse 14. And it was, and it was, on the, it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. This is how they got Jesus, by the way. This is one of the ways they were able to convict him in that kangaroo court because he did labor on the Sabbath day. Then again, the Pharisees also asked him, how had he received his sign? He said unto him, I put clay on my eyes and I washed and do see. Pretty simple. Amen? Therefore said some of the Pharisees, this man, uh, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And, and there was a division among them. You know, the Sabbath. What is the Sabbath? The Sabbath is Saturday. It's not the seventh day. The Sabbath means Shabbat. It's a cessation of work. And yet... If you had a flat tire going from here to there on the Sabbath day, which one of you wouldn't change the tire if you could? Of course. No, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus takes care of that in his own teaching. Amen? And those folks that are Sabbath keepers say, you go to church on Sunday? Oh, you're no, that's the mark of the beast. That's crazy. First of all, let me give you a little instruction on this. Ooh, I've got to hurry. You have to listen faster. Hey, the Sabbath has nothing to do with going to church. It doesn't say in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it doesn't say anything about going to church in the Sabbath. It just says a, a, a Sabbath, a Shabbat, is just a cessation of work. Don't work. Don't work. doesn't say go and worship. The Sabbath is a day of rest. You know, me and Judy and some of our other ministers around here, old Bill and Ricardo back there, our ushers, so Sunday is not a big day of rest for us. It's not a big day of rest. Not for our, not for our praise team, our, our, our double K's back there, Kim Gillespie, Kim Hawker, uh, our, our musicians. It's not a day of rest. It is a day of worship. But let me ask you this. Are we to worship one day a week or seven days a week? Day. We're to worship seven days a week. I like uh, Bill, remember old... old uh, Steve Gregg, he says, so I'll be holy one day a week and raise Cain, the other six. That's crazy. No, Jesus Christ is our Shabbat. He is our Sabbath. In him we have rest. And I rest in him all week. And I worship him all week, every day, everywhere I go. This doesn't have anything to do with going to church. So next time you get one of those Sabbath keepers, they beat you over the head, just say, hey, it doesn't have anything to do with going to church. Why don't you come with me? Uh, and I'll tell you why we come to church on Monday. I mean Sunday, the first day of the week, because that's when the disciples met. Why? Because that's when Jesus rose from the grave. We celebrate. Every Sunday is technically Easter here at Desert Hills. All right, let's move on. And, and it was the Sabbath day, and it says this, oh, I'm sorry, where was I? Verse 17, they said unto the blind man again, what sayest thou of him? And he hath opened thine eyes, and he said, he is a prophet. He said he is a prophet. But the Jews uh, did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him that had received his sight. They didn't even believe this man's testimony or the people that had brought it to him, so they brought the parents in. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who ye say, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he, uh, he now see? His parents answered them and said, we know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But by what means now he seeth, we do not know. Or who hath opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age, ask him. He's a big boy, talk to him yourself. Talk to him yourself. 
I love out of the mouth of babes when children witness and testify to the glory and the love and the forgiveness of God. But how much more so those of age? Those of age. God saved even a wretch like me. Yes, he says, he's of age. Go ask him yourself. He shall speak for himself. Verse 22. These words spake his parents because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was, the, he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. You see, they had usurped the authority of God. Why? Because they're self-righteous. The self-righteous will always usurp the authority of God. And they will never recognize the things of Christ. It says, uh, therefore, said his parents, he is of age. Again, ask him and he'll tell you. Then again, they called the man that was blind and said unto him, by God, uh, uh, he said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner, speaking of Jesus. He answered and said, whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know, where I was blind, now I see. Now that's a witness. See, be prepared for the unexpected, be prepared for instruction, be prepared to obey, and be prepared to give a witness. I once was blind, but now I see. They say, well, man, you know, I don't get it. You know, this is just a phase you're going through. I don't know if it's a phase. I sure hope it lasts the rest of my life. They say, well, that's just a bunch of psychology. Somebody told you you're forgiven, so you feel forgiven. No, I know I'm forgiven. Because Jesus paid the price for me. Now, you know what? I, I know, we know he's no sinner. But this man is speaking very plain. He says, I don't know who he was. All I know is I was blind and now I see. What do you do after you're saved? Give testimony. Give testimony. D David says that he, he yearned my, my paraphrase, to give testimony and speak of God's goodness in the midst of the brethren. In the midst of the brethren. The, no better place to praise God and speak of the testimony of His goodness in your life than amongst the brethren. Do you know why? A lot of us could use it. A lot of us could use it. And, and in doing you may not have to preach, you may not have to teach, and you certainly don't want to go around with the humble brag, well, guess what God did for me today? I tell you what, you know. No, but you can testify without doing that humble brag garbage. That's pride. And just say, God is so good to me. God is so good to me. Trust me, it's hard not to strut. God gave me another oak here recently. His name is Titus Andrew. Hard for me not to strut, but it's nothing I did. All glory and praise to the God of life to the God of life who knits us in the matrix of our mother's womb. Fabric unknown to mankind. Man cannot make life. Only God can make life. No, be prepared for the unexpected to get instruction, to obey, and to give testimony. I once was blind, now I see. Then said they unto him, verse 26, What did he to thee? Open thine, how did he open thine eyes? And he answered, I've already told you. <laughs> I've already told you. And you did not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Why, uh, will ye also be his disciple? They said, what, do you want to sign up too? You want to get the mail? You want to get the letter? You want to be his disciple? And what did they do? They reviled him. They reviled him and said, thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciple. Moses' disciple? If they had really known Moses, they would have recognized Jesus. No, no, they were self-righteous uh, an authority unto themselves. We know that God spake unto Moses as far as this fellow. We know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why wherein is, a marvelous, is this a marvelous thing, that ye know not from whence he is? And yet he hath opened mine eyes. He says, how can you not know where he's come from, guys? I was blind, now I see. He goes on. 
majestic King James language. He says, the man answered and said to them, uh, my, he says, wherein was marvelous thing that you know not where he is, uh, whence he came from, and yet ye have opened my eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, he heareth him. Since the world began, it has not been heard of that a man be uh, a man opened the eyes of one who was born blind. No one who was ever born blind had regained their sight. That was a fact. That was a fact. He says, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast to get, was altogether born in sins, and thou dost teach us. That's funny. They, you know, call, that's the pot calling the kettle black right there. The cat calling the dog fuzzy. Here you, born in sins, you're going to judge us, the Pharisees. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Again, these Pharisees were like religious lawyers. But they pick and chose that which they would believe from the very scriptures that they say Moses gave them. Uh, if this man, well, of course, he's quoting a prophet there, but in general, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. Jesus heard that they had, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out, the blind man. And when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered, he said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he, the blind man, said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. And he worshipped him. We've got to get back to worshipping him. Hey, prepare for the unexpected. Things will happen. It's going to be okay. Nobody I have ever met can see around a corner, let alone the future. Prepare for the unexpected. Prepare for instruction. Prepare to receive instruction. What does that mean? Be humble in spirit. Read, pray, study. Come to the gatherings that we have. Prepare for instruction and then prepare to obey whatever he tells you to do. Remembering that he will never tell you to do anything contrary to his word. You hear about these stories, haven't heard them in a long time. But I'm, in the 90s, it seemed like there was one mother after another going off the deep end saying that God had told them to kill their child. Have mercy. God would never tell you to do such a thing. Ever. Prepare your heart to obey. Obey that which is congruent and agrees with His Word. Prepare to obey and prepare to worship. Coming before God, in agreement with God, loving God, having given testimony by your presence in the midst of God's people. It, it's a real easy and it's a, it's a simple platitude to just say, now that you're saved, you ought to go to church. And I say, amen, yeah. But now that you're saved, you should want to go to church. You hear that, radio? You hear that interwebs, YouTube? Now that you're saved, you should want to go to church. Because here's the story. Whether you are preparing yourself to give testimony in the midst of the congregation or not, you will stand in the presence of the risen Christ one day, and we're all going to be there anyway. So you better start getting to learn to love one another now, because you're going to have to put up with us for eternity then. And if you can't, and you won't, go and congregate with all those hypocrites. Well, you'll never have anything unexpected in your life. Everything will be done according to the cookie sheet. You'll never receive instruction from on high. Your testimony will be, will be nothing, if, if anything at all. And... and uh, you will never know the blessedness of obedience to the Father through the Son. And in short, you will never experience what it means to really worship the living God.